Okay, hello everyone. Uh, well, welcome to the anthropology seminar. Today's uh, speaker is Kevin Even Peterman uh, from Philips University at Marburg. Uh, Marburg, I think hopefully I pronounced right. Yeah. Um, okay, well, thanks very much for accepting our invitation. Um, so he's going to tell us about uh, advances on uh, Cullen's conjecture. So Kevin, please take it, take it away. Okay, well, thank you very much to you for, for the invitation to your seminar. And good morning or good afternoon or good night to, to everyone. I don't know where you are. And so I would tell you about this work on this conjecture, right, by Quillen in the 70s. Uh, this is the joint work with Stephen Smith. And so we started working on this, and maybe now it will be like almost four years ago, right after my PhD, uh, when I got some minor results on the conjecture, then he reached me out asking about that. And then we started a collaboration together. So we achieved some good results. So this is what I would like to present you here. So the talk uh, will involve this, some very basic stuff on archetype topology, even there is almost no computation on that, maybe at the end of the talk, but maybe there are some words on final uh, on concepts on final group theory. Then if you don't feel comfortable with that, please stop me and ask me. So, I will start. Uh, so our setting will be the following. So G will be always denote the finite group and P a prime number. So in this talk, all simplicial complexes, both sets of groups are finite. Everything is finite. And P is a prime number then, the, dividing the order of the group if you want. And we define equivalent pose to be uh, the set of all non-trivial elementary abelian P subgroups of G. So recall that an elementary abelian P group is uh, direct products of cyclic groups of order P, or in this in non abelian notation, this is CP, or in the abelian notation, you can write it down as this. This is a finite direct product, okay? And in particular, we see that uh, A is a, a finite dimensional vector space over the field of P elements, and the dimension of A is the rank of A, which is the, the, the minimum uh, size of a generating set of A, of, or of a basis of A. And uh, this is the rank or P rank of A. So APG, this set of non-trivial elementary abelian P subgroups of G is supposed with the order given by the inclusion between the subgroups. And of course, we have here an action by conjugation of the group G. So the general idea is to try to establish connection between algebraic properties of the group G and combinatorial topological properties of APG. And other constructions relating to G is just that uh, the cohomology of the group. So why do we want to study P group complexes? So one of the first appearance of these uh, things on the literature uh, comes back to, goes back to Quillen, the 71, for example, he established the idea of Schramm conjecture. This means that he, uh, he proved that the cruel dimension of the cohomology of the group with coefficients model P equals to the P rank of the group which is one plus the dimension of this poset. So the P rank here is the, the largest possible dimension of an elementary abelian P subgroup of G. So, okay, so this is only talking on the dimension of this poset, but still this, this uh, already uh, involves uh, an investigation on the elementary abelian P subgroup of the group. Another strong result also um, by Kenneth Brown in the 19th relates the group cohomology of G module P with the equivariant cohomology of APG uh, module P also. So he proved that they are the same. And here by the equivariant cohomology, I mean, this is the Verdon cohomology of, of this uh, G space, which is a cohomology theory that some, some, somehow remembers that you have a group action. So this, it constructs the cohomology by recalling that we have the group action of G. So in the, in the general construction of group cohomology, you don't take into account the group actions, right? It is an abstract construction without group actions. Okay, so this means that uh, the, the, the equivariant cohomology or, or multiple type of this process is very important to compute the cohomology of the group. Another result also by Quillen uh, established a, a, a strong connection between an actual property and a topological property. So he proved that APC it is connected as a topological space if and only if G has a strongly p-embedded subgroup. So I think I didn't mention that, but I see every poset as a topological space via uh, the geometrialization of its order complex. 
Okay, so that's why we can regard a poset as a topological space via its classifying space, which is its order complex. So this poset is connected if and only if she has uh, this subgroup, contains this subgroup. And I won't give the definition of this subgroup, but I will only mention that the classification of groups with this property is crucial during the classification of the finite simple groups. So these uh, letters here means the classification of the finite simple groups, and it, it will appear later also on this talk. So uh, another uh, result by Quillen also, uh, if, if we take OPG to be the largest normal p subgroup of G, which means it's just the, 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 among all normal p subgroups, just take the largest one. Sorry, can I ask something? Yes, yes, of course. Um, so uh, the strong groups with strongly two embedded subgroups are classified, is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, and... yeah, this is for, for every prime p. Oh, for every p, they're, they're known. Okay. Yeah, yes, for every day, there, there, there is a list. We basically reduce it to simple groups. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. So, yes, so in this item here, this is a clear connection between an intrinsic algebraic property of the group on one hand and an, and, and a topological property on the other hand. This is the kind of dictionary or translation uh, that, that I mentioned in the previous slide. This is the kind of things we would like to have in general. So now I will give you another example on that. So OPG is the largest normal P subgroup of G, and Quillen proved that if this subgroup is non-trivial, then APG is a contractible topological space. We can say it in a different way. Note that OPG non-trivial, this is basically a normal P subgroup, a non-trivial normal P subgroup, and this is equivalent to having a fixed point on the posted APG. That is, uh, you, you have a non-trivial, normal elementary abelian P subgroup if and only if OPG is non-trivial. So say it in a different way, this blue thing here says that if she has a fixed point on this poset, then this poset is contractible. And we usually ask for the converse, right? When we have an action of a group on a contractible space, we ask if it is true that there is a fixed point, right? This is the, the usual question, but this goes on the converse. So the converse of that question is true for the APC poset. But then William conjecture that the usual question should be true. That means if APC is contractible, then there is a fixed point. Or equivalently, if there is no fixed point, then this poset is not contractible. So different formulation this means that Quillen's conjecture means that this poset is contractible if and only if it has a fixed point, if and only if this subgroup OPG is non trivial. So, this is again this, uh, this translation of a topological property into an intrinsic algebraic property of the group. So, in general, to prove that some space is not contractible, like in the formulation of the conjecture here, might not be so easy by showing that some specific homotopy group is non-trivial, but you usually show that some homology group is non-trivial. So we usually work with a stronger formulation of the conjecture in terms of uh, rational homology, or free homology. So we usually work with this version of the conjecture that if OPC is trivial, then this should imply that uh, we have non-zero free homology in some degree. Okay, so this results by Quillen uh, and this conjecture appears uh, in this paper in uh, the 78. And now I will denote this conjecture, conjecture by HQC. So HQC is this conjecture that we have non-zero uh, free homology when OBG is trivial. So this conjecture is still open, but I will show you advances on it and we, we would see that many cases are proved. So for example, William proved the following cases of this version. He showed that this holds when G is a group of lead type in characteristic P. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the definition of a group of lead type. You can imagine that this is a matrix group like PSL, PSU, symplectic group, orthogonal groups. 
some of this kind also there are exceptional groups of Lie type that will appear later in the talk. But it's basically these groups and in characteristic P, the characteristics of the defining field of these groups, of these matrix groups. And okay, so in this case, this, the poset is homotopy equivalent to the building. So the APC is homotopy equivalent to the building of the group. And we know that the building of the group is homotopy equivalent to the wedge of spheres. So we have non-zero homology because it is a wedge of spheres, non-trivial wedge of spheres. So that case is done. Another interesting case also proved at Quillen is when uh, the P rank of the group is at most two. So recall that this number is the, the largest possible dimension of an elementary abelian visa group. So this, this number is at most two if and only if the dimension of APC is at most one, right? Because the dimension is one minus the rank. The rank, sorry, rank minus one. So when APC has dimension at most one, then this is contractible. This is a graph, basically. So this is contractible if and only if it is a tree. And we know by Searle's theorem that uh, an action, a, fi a finite group acting on a tree, has a fixed point. Finite tree in this case has a fixed point. So that case is done. Also, so Williams' conjecture is a kind of generalization of that result. Another uh, case, which is not so straightforward, is when G is a solvable group. So uh, the proof of this case is longer now, and it requires um, a kind of reduction to a minimal situation. It's a, it's a classical proof in group theories. In finite group theory, you, you try to arrive by induction. So you start making several reductions. Then at some point, you reach to a kind of minimal configuration. And then Quillen showed that in that minimal configuration, what you get is a, it's a comma called like complex or also a wedge of spheres of a maximal possible dimension. So he indeed, he proved that not only we have non-zero homology, but what we get is non-zero homology in the largest possible degree, okay, which is the dimension of the complex, basically. So he proved that if OPC is trivial in this case, then she satisfies this property, QDP, which means that we have non-zero homology in the top degree, which is the rank minus one. Okay, so this is uh, the Quillen dimension property, uh, which was called later by the other authors, not like Quillen. Um, but this will be very important in the talk. So when she's a solvable group, it satisfies this property QDP. So when OPC is trivial, then we have non zero homology in top degree. And in particular, the conjecture is true for solvable groups. So um, later, uh, several authors try to extend this proof uh, by Quillen to P solvable groups. And they also show that this property is satisfied by P of other groups when OPC is trivial. So in particular, also the conjecture is true for P of other groups. But the difference here is that for this proof, they had to use the classification of the final simple groups, basically because they had, you have to say something about the simple if, uh, components of the group, the, the simple factors of the group, we may be non-abelian in this case. <laughs> Okay, so, so so far, any any questions on the, on this? Maybe on the language. Could you remind what P solvable is? Yeah. Yeah. So a P solvable groups, and when you take the the composition series of the group, then you ask the factors to be either a P group or a, a group of order prime to P. So the simple factors that appear in the composition series are either a P groups, if you want, or non-abelian. A simple growth of order prime, no, uh, or simple growth of order prime to be. Okay. This is or P groups or prime to be, basically. Okay. Um, uh, maybe, uh, sorry, yeah. in, in the first case, you said the uh, complex is homotopy equivalent to the Tits building, right? That's, yes. Is, was it because the Tits building is the same as the uh, P subgroups or something like that? Or? Yes, it's also, yes. In okay. fact, APC is always a multiple equivalent to the P subgroups on the non, mm -hmm. all the non trivial P subgroups. Yes, they are a multiple okay. equivalent. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yes, in that case, this is a multiple equivalent to the parabolic subgroups, which, which indeed is, is basically that's the building. 
Okay, so now I will mention like one of the most important results towards the resolution of this conjecture, which is a paper by Ashbach and Smith. So uh, they show the following that uh, the conjecture, this version of the conjecture holds if uh, we take the prime p bigger than five, and we also have the following condition uh, on unitary groups. So each time I have a PSU, this uh, projective, uh, projective uh, unitary groups uh, over the field of Q to the square elements. Here I write Q, but I mean, this is defined over Q to the square with the condition that P divides Q plus one and Q is an odd prime power. Okay, so this is the finite unitary groups. This is the component of the group. I will define it now. So uh, when this is a component of the group, what I need what I need is that all the extensions, the p extensions of the unitary groups of smaller dimension defined over arbitrary powers of Q satisfy this QDP property, which means we have non-zero homology in top degree. OK, so each time I have a unitary component like this, every possible p extension of a unitary group of smaller dimension has to satisfy this property. So what is a component of a group? So a component is a subnormal subgroup, which means it's like the, the transitive closure uh, of the normal re relation. And it is also quasi-simple, which means it is perfect and we take the quotient by the center, and this is simple. Okay, so this is a component. So in particular, if this is simple, if this is already simple, then this condition is satisfied. And but this then PSU is mostly simple, so um, this is already quasi simple. So these are the when the PSU appears as a subnormal subgroup of G, then we need this condition. And what I mean by P extension, so a P extension of L is a split extension of L by uh, an elementary abelian P group inducing outer automorphisms on L. And I also, I also take here the trivial subgroup. So L is itself a trivial P extension of L, okay? So in particular, these groups satisfy, uh, what I ask for this group is to satisfy the equivalent dimension property, non-zero homology in top degree. This is what I want for PSU and all the possible extension of it. So uh, if we can prove this, then the conjecture will be done for primes bigger than five, according to the result of Ashbacher and Smith. So my work uh, started more or less from this theorem and, and say, okay, what can we do now for the remaining primes and if we can eliminate this restriction on the unitary groups? So, uh, so if we want to address the conjecture from this point, we need to understand why they impose this restriction and why we have also this restriction on the unitary groups, on the prime and the unitary groups. So let's talk a little bit about that. And so any, any questions on the terminology definitions or something? It's okay. Okay, so I move on. So how do we prove this theorem? So as, as I said before, we usually are by induction. So we take a minimal contract example under uh, the statement of the theorem with this assumption. So we take OPG trivial and we want to show that some homology group is non-zero. So we take a minimal contract example to it, to this conjecture. Okay, so now assume that P is a not prime and if P is a not prime, what Ashwachen and Smith proved that is that uh, if the following groups do not appear as a component of our group, here I have a Suzuki group, a PSL and PSU, these three groups for P5 and 3. If we don't have these groups as components, then we can perform several reductions somehow. Okay, so these groups are kind of, a, of an abstraction. And that's why they require that P is bigger than five. This is one of the, re the main reasons that P bigger than five is one of the requirements because these groups, we don't like them. So if we assume that they do not appear, then we can perform several reductions. And for example, we can prove if we have a component, 
such that every extension has this QDP property has non-zero models in top degree. If we have this property in, in some of the component, then we can construct a non-zero cycle. But since we are in a minimal contrary example, this shouldn't be possible. So every component has a P extension failing this property. And then what they proved is that this is what we don't expect in general. That is, in general, P extensions of simple groups will satisfy this property. So they made a short list, a kind of short list with uh, all possible P extensions of simple groups, which may fail this property, this QDP property. Okay, so it's a kind of short list, and this is for every odd prime, including three and five. So this means that under this reduction, a component of the group, which is now a simple group, appears on this list. And guess what? The unitary groups are here because they are not able to show that P extension of unitary groups uh, satisfy this property. So this is why they appear in the theorem because they cannot get rid of them by other methods. For the remaining groups on this list, they, they do something else. So they are not a problem, but for the unitary groups, they cannot do this other thing. So this is why they appear in the statement of the theorem. So if we want to finish the proof, for p bigger than five of the conjecture for p bigger than five, we need to get rid of the unitary groups somehow. And the conjecture is that these groups should satisfy this QDP property. The p extension of these groups should satisfy this property. Okay, so now let me tell you uh, on the new results of Williams' conjecture. So we try to um, argue by more general combinatorial arguments, uh, independent on the prime uh, p. Are, yes. Before we move on, uh, first, I, I assume that the list was longer than just unitary groups, right? So they handled other possible cases. Is it the paper they wrote deals yeah. with other simple p functions of simples? Is it primary what they do, or is it? Uh, for this list, yeah. So, is how long, or is it what they do that get rid of other uh, p extensions except the unity one? Is it? Uh, okay. Yes. I mean, the, the, the other infinite families appear in this list. I mean, this is the list of p extensions of simple groups that fa may fail this property. For example, for sure, we have here all the simple groups of Lie type in characteristic p. Because they are a wedge of spheres, that's that's okay. But the sphere have lower dimension because the, the, the dimension is related to the rank of the group in that case, the Lie rank of the group, which is much smaller than the P rank. So it is a wedge of a sphere, but not in top dimension. So they for sure are there. So we but, have... Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. But Ashbar uh, uh, says that only that this is assumption that unitary groups should satisfy that QDP. Yes. So the others somehow get rid of the yes. others? They, they get rid of the others by using something different, not by using this property. They, they, they show that they satisfy a, a different property that, and, and allow to conclude uh, with their theorem. Okay. Yeah. And what is the uh, current uh, status of the Unitary case, is it all still how it is left at the time? Yeah, I, I will let you know in a few minutes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I will talk about it. So, um, well, as I said, that's what I, what I, we would try to do, we were trying to do is to try to um, give more general arguments independent on the prime and on the classification because one of the main uh, tools in the paper of by Schwacher and Smith is that they use the classification too much to, uh, in my opinion <laughs> so that's why they left out the prime p equals 2 uh, because they, they strongly rely on of, of out prime to characterize the p extension of, of simple groups for example so okay so we say we, we can try to perform some of the uh, reductions that to avoid the use of the classification and rely on the prime. So 
with more combinatorial, we can extend some of the things so we, by using more combinatorial arguments and then extend these reductions to every prime p. So one of the things that we did first is to get rid of these problematic components that I mentioned at the beginning. So we said that these components were basically the abstraction with, for the p bigger than five, at least for odd primes p. So for odd primes, we can, we can get rid of this by using combinatorial arguments because this group, all of them satisfy some particular property, but there is an argument that allows us to eliminate them from a minimal contract example. So we can eliminate that at the beginning. So they are not contained in a minimal contract example. So we can go on with the proof. Um, more or less, there are some problems in the middle, but more or less you can extend the proof to every odd prime. So one of the first uh, consequences is that we can extend the theorem by Schwacher that means to p equals three and five. So to every odd prime. Uh, but there are other constraints uh, on the way, especially for p equals three. There are other groups that uh, are bothering in the middle so that you have to get rid of them by using other methods, but, but that's okay. So now on the unitary groups, so there is a recent paper by Antonio Diaz Ramos. So this I think this is from April of this year, where he showed that uh, these unitary groups, PSU and PCU, they satisfy the equivalent dimension property. Okay, so this goes on the direction that we want, that we still need all the P possible P extensions here. So the P extension that remains is the extension by field automorphisms of order p. So a field automorphism of order p is basically an automorphism of the underlying field, which is q to the square of order p. And this is the only extension that remains. So as a corollary, if we can prove that PCU extended by a field automorphism here of order p, if this one satisfies this property, qdp, then we are done for odd primes p. Okay, this is only this only this remains to prove the conjecture for odd primes. Only this extension. Sorry, how did you reduce from an arbitrary p extension to a, an extension by a field automorphism again? Okay, because the outer automorphism group is not so big. Oh. So recall that the p extensions you basically need to classify the p, uh, p elementary abelian subroof of the outer automorphism group of PSU in this case. So the outer automorphism group of PSU is, is not so big. It's basically what is called a diagonal automorphism and a field automorphism. Mm -hmm. So you have basically three or four extensions. One is the trivial one, PSU. The other one is PGU. And the other two are these two extended by a field automorphism of order p. Nice. PSU extended by a p or by a field of automorphism of order p and PCU by a field automorphism of order p. These are the, the other two. And you can show that you can prove that it, it is enough to prove that PCU extended by a field automorphism of order p uh, satisfies QDP in order to prove that the other one also satisfies QDP. Mm. Okay, thank you. So, so they, yes, they are basically for that. This is why, this is also why we require p odd because when you go to p equals two, you have more. Uh, well, not maybe not in this case, but for other groups, you have a lot of uh, extensions, and that becomes more complicated to classify. So, okay, so this is for odd primes. N now I will move to the results on p equals two, and then we we will talk a little bit about this problem also. So um, for p equals two, as I said, we, we have more combinatorial results. So it allows us to extend many of the reduction that they made, Ashwakar and Pete made in their paper to p equals two by avoiding the use of the classification. So we can formulate a theorem, our theorem in this way. So assume p equals two, and she is a minimal contract example to our conjecture. Okay. So what we get is following the two prime core of G is trivial. So this guy here is the largest normal subroot of G of odd order, okay? So OPG is of order, it's a P group. So 
two prime of g is of order prime to two, so odd order in this case. So this subgroup is trivial, and every component, and here appears again the components, the components of g, all of them admit to extension inside g. Okay, not, they are, do not only appear L, but also L extended by some outer automorphism, they, they appear inside G. So this in particular means that they must admit an outer automorphism of order two, they must. And also we can perform the same reduction on this property QD, QD2 in this case. So every component of the group, which is now a simple group, a subnormal simple group, has some two extension, which fails this property QD2, which may be L itself. Okay, so this is number three, it's basically the same reduction that they did on their paper. And we have another one. So she has a component, uh, which is a group of Lie type in characteristic different from two or three, or if we have a component in characteristic two, it is only one of these three. So here we have the linear group in characteristic two, in dimension at least three. And here the n to a, this is the, the, one of the orthogonal groups in even characteristic, uh, or we have this exceptional group of Lie type E6. So, Maybe at this point it's worth to mention what is the classification of the finite simple groups. So the classification states that a non-abelian simple group is either alternating uh, sporadic, one of the 26 sporadic groups or a group of T type. So here we are saying that we have a component which is not alternating and not sporadic. For sure we have a component of Lie type in characteristic different from two or three, and in characteristic two, only these three possibilities. For example, there are no unitary here in characteristic two or symplectic, okay? And also we would like to mention that the first three reductions do not depend on the classification. They are purely combinatorial. And also do not depend on two, do not depend on the prime. So they are purely combinatorial uh, arguments. But in item four, and for this reduction, we need to use the classification in order uh, to exclude uh, components on non Lie type. Okay, so more results on P equals two? Yes. Can I ask you a quick question? When you say material, uh, I'm not sure if you're going to talk about this later, but do you use some sort of reduction argument on the simplicial complex or something about the, like, what kind of argument uh, you use and when you say it's combinatorial? Yes. Okay. Great question. Yes. I won't give details on that, but maybe now that you ask, maybe I can mention how, uh, how we do that a little bit. So uh, somehow in the, in the posted APC, uh, you have like points, the elements of the poset which have contractible link, okay? Which mm -hmm. the, the link of an element is what you see above and what you see below. What you see below is, is basically the poset of subspaces in this case, because each element is an elementary abelian P group, which is vector space maybe over FP. So what you see below are the subspaces and the subspaces are a wedge of a sphere. Right, so below you always see wedge of spheres, but above, by taking, by being a little bit caref careful, sometimes you see a contractible thing, some a contractible poset. This means that this vertex in the simplicial complex can be removed because its link is contractible. So you have a kind of collapse. So with this idea in mind, what we do is, is try to understand the homotopy type of APG if we fix a component L. The components are well behaved somehow as subgroups. And we say, okay, we take L, well, maybe you can draw something here. Okay, we, we take a component L and then we take the centralizer. 
of the component. Okay, so this is a kind of big group. And then we take the poset here, AP of this. Sorry, the sensitivity uh, sensitivity sensitivity of this mouse is not good enough. So um, we take that this product, this is a central product of loops, right? This is a, now L is a component. In our case, it's a simple group. And we want this to be kind of maximal configuration. And then we try to produce a homology cycle from here, okay? And then show that this homology cycle, non-trivial homology cycle, is also non-trivial homology cycle in the world group when we include it. So this is not true in general, but if we take a suitable extension, P extension here, we add a V, okay? Then under some maximal conditions, you can prove that. Okay, so this is basically the core for the proof of uh, item three for this property, basically, because here QDP means that you have a maximal cycle. And this maximality will allow you to show that under a construction of an extra cycle on this side, we, you can ask uh, R by induction there. And because that's a smaller group, then you can produce a shine of two cycles. And then this will be a non-trivial cycle in the big group under some conditions. And now, uh, what you can also do in this pose it is th there are many things that somehow, uh, somehow they are bothering you. So you will change the pose at APG by a different one constructed from this one, but, but, but just adding those elementary abelian subgroups, maybe I call them A, which intersect, uh, sorry, I can use different color. Okay, I will add the A's which intersect this whole subgroup trivially. So the intersection of this group with A is trivial. So now I will pick AP of this group. I don't know, call it H. So I will take APH here. And the remaining points A, which intersect with H trivially. Okay, and then I will add them as a, as a pose set in other points here. And then I will establish some relation with this pose set. Like one is below an element there, if and only if it centralizes something there. Okay, so the centralizer, I have A here, is below an element V here. Well, V is above V prime there, if and only if uh, some part of V B prime centralizes A. So I take this new pose set. Okay, then we show that this two APG and this one, this new one, are homotopy equivalent. But this one has fewer points, right? Because, for example, all those elements that are not in this pose set, but they intersect this subgroup non trivially, they are not there anymore. So this is a smaller, and this in this pose set is somehow simpler to construct homology cycles by using this kind of inductive arguments, which things that are in APH and maybe some points that are outside there. So this is more or less the idea of the proofs of these items here. Basically three and four, this is what we use there. I don't know if it's, it's too much insights or not, but this is basically the idea of what we want to do. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, in, in superficial terms, this basically, well, it's not exactly a collapse because we are actually changing the ordering. We are using different poses, different ordering. It's like, okay, I, ca I have a sub H, I take APH, and then the points that are somehow outside, I put them below by using kind of centralizer condition. Of course, some points won't be below if you don't centralize anything, but this is more or less the idea to change the poset. And that's allow us to like emphasize how APG is obtained and by gluing elements, by gluing vertices through the links in, in, in a given poset. This is the idea. I mean, this is the classical arguments Kulin also uses, right? by taking products and uh, 
Yes. And moving things. Yes. This is Eric. Okay, we thanks. To, yeah, the, the idea is to try to understand like inductively the homotopy type of the complex. And here we have a very nice structure with the subgroups. So we take a very nice subgroups, uh, which is usually of this type, a component times its centralizer. And this is good enough. So if one of them is a simple group, so there we have to make computations. And on the other hand, we have the centralizer where we have inductive hypothesis there, we can say, okay. Um, but well, yes. Okay, now I would like to remove all the, okay, here. Good. So, some more results on P equals two. As I said, one of the main reductions is that every component, which is a simple group, has a two extension failing key, this property QD2, which means that we have an, ex an extension LV, which has zero homology in top degree. Okay, this is the property that, that we have. Every, ex every component has a two extension with this property. So a problem will be, okay, let's classify uh, all simple groups which every uh, for which every two extensions actually satisfies this property. But as I said before, it might be very complicated in some groups, for example, in the linear groups or the orthogonal groups in even dimension, you have a lot of two extensions and try to classify it. It's quite a mess. <laughs> but maybe for some of them, some group of Litai, for example, which few extension, it can be done. So this is in fact the theorem for simple groups of the exceptional Lie type in not characteristic. So in even characteristic, I already mentioned we, a reduction and I said, okay, this reduces to basically three families, the linear, the, the orthogonal groups and the E6 groups. So in all dimension, at least for exceptional groups of Lie type, uh, what I was able to prove is that uh, if it fails this property, if you have a simple group of exceptional Lie type in not characteristic such that some two extension fails QD2, then it must be one of these ones, which we have here exactly eight groups. This is a finite list. There is no infinite family here. It's only of these eight groups. And I think all of them are in characteristic three. And I, at some point I mentioned that characteristic three was not a problem at all. So basically, Basically, this theorem says that exceptional groups of Lie type do not bother me for the case P equals two of the conjecture. Okay, so we can get rid of them. And actually, some of them actually fail this property in, in a given extension. When a nine appears here, like here, it means that the extension that fails is the extension by a field automorphism of order two. This is the extension that fails because this is three to the square. So I have a field automorphism of order two. And in the in the bigger ones like a, EA3 or E89, this I don't know. And they are too big to try in my computer. So that's why I don't know there if, it, by, by inductive arguments, I cannot prove it. And I also cannot prove that they actually failed. So that's why they are in the list. So, I think I have just a few uh, minutes uh, less. Um, I can give you a, a brief overview of how this proof goes on. So for, to prove this theorem, what, what I did first is to argue, like kind of find induction and prove it for uh, groups of Lie type of small ranks. This means that I prove this property that every extension satisfies uh, that has non-zero homology in top degree, I start from the linear groups in dimension two and three and the unitary groups in dimension three. Okay, I start for these smaller ones. And for this, I mostly use counting arguments to produce non-zero cycles in the homology in the degree I want. And then I go to the exceptional groups of Lie type. These are strange families, uh, the twisted groups. And, and here, what I do is I use a kind of classification of its maximal several. So ideally, I will take an extension and I will look for the maximal subgroups. And the maximal subgroups usually are either parabolic subgroups or direct product of subgroups which uh, already know the structure somehow. So what I look is for a maximal subgroup H, which has the same rank as my extension, 
and since it has the same rank, we have an inclusion in the top homology group because this is the top homology group. Otherwise, this is not true. So I have an inclusion here. So if I show that for the maximal subgroup, I have non-zero homology, then I'm done because this propagates to non-zero homology in the big group, in the extension, okay? So I can go to the list of part of the list of maximal subgroups of exceptional groups of the type and take the one that fits these requirements. So if it is a parabolic subgroup that has the correct rank, I mean, it has the full rank, and this is a parabolic subgroup, then we are basically done because we, we are in odd characteristic and we can take uh, the unipotent radical of the parabolic subgroup times the elementary abelian P subgroup of maximal rank so this is a semi-direct product, which is a solvable group, which I here I denoted by K, and it has trivial two core because we're P equal to two. We have trivial two core, and this then a solvable group with trivial two core, uh, and then we are done by Quillen's result because he, as, as I said at the beginning, he showed that for solvable groups we have this property. So we have the property for K. It has the same rank as H. So we have the property of, uh, for H by this inclusion in the homology, and then we can propagate this to G, to the whole group LB in this case. And when this is not possible, because we have no parabolic subgroup with this property, okay, we, we look for direct product of groups, something like this. Uh, okay, we try to find H of this shape where each component, H1 and H2, satisfy this property. And then if we look at the homology, then this homology group decomposes as the tensor product of the top dimensional uh, homology groups of the posets of each of the components, or H1 and H2. So if I prove that these two are non-zero, they are done, basically. And then here, usually for exceptional groups of Lie type, what I get, H1 uh, will be, for example, a linear group of a unitary group of a small dimension, one of these three. And then the other one, I will get probably an, another exceptional group of a smaller, the rank or dimension, and, and also an arc by induction because I already proved uh, for that group uh, before that it satisfies the, 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 the property that I, that I want. So this is more or less the idea of how we can prove this result. Uh, okay, so uh, any questions so far? So you mentioned in the previous slide um, that there are possibly um, eight exceptions, and you said two of them are certainly are exceptions, and two of them you don't know. How about the other four? Uh, no, I, I think I now I don't remember exactly which I okay. already uh, I know. I think two or three of them I, I made a computation and actually they fail. Probably mm. three D four nine uh, mostly sure the, the the smaller one for sure they fail. Uh, I think it's three D four and she. To three and she to nine and probably they fail. And for the remaining ones, I don't know because uh, I I I I prove it. I prove this with with a computer more or less. I made some mm -hmm. reductions theoretically, like this change of posets. I reduce the posets to something smaller. Then I show. Then I can compute the homology there because it's not so big. But then even for f four three and f four nine and a e eight and this, for these families, I, I cannot do it. I mean, these this are already too big. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried some reductions, but I, I, I couldn't uh, make it. I mean, it's, it's sometimes if you can get a, a posted, which is a homotopic equivalent and a smaller dimension, then you are done basically because you reduce the dimension and it, for sure it will fail. So this is what happened with some of them. Uh, but for the other ones, I wasn't able to get the post of a smaller dimension. If I perform the same reduction, I get the same dimension, so I cannot mm -hmm. go on. So probably they satisfy the property, but I cannot prove it uh, uh, in a simpler way or in the same way. I mean, so, something mm -hmm. extra has to be done, probably. Thanks. You're welcome. So... Um, I don't know how much do I have left, like five minutes or nothing. I can finish here if you want. Uh, yes, you can go for five more minutes, sure. Okay, so maybe I can very briefly tell something about 
uh, okay, there is some an extra slide here. Okay, as a consequence of this theorem, what I get is for, for p equals two, if I have I have a component of lead type as, as we said before, for sure, and a component in characteristic different from three is one of this type. It's either in characteristic two, what we already mentioned before, or in characteristic uh, different from two and three is one of the classical groups, basically, which because we uh, the exceptional groups of the type cannot appear in not characteristic. So this is basically the list of uh, classical groups, the linear here, plus and minus being linear or unitary, uh, odd dimensional orthogonal groups, symplectic groups, and the two types of orthogonal groups in even dimensions. So what we could do next is to try to ex extend, uh, try to prove this property for classical groups. It's QD2 property now for classical groups. There are some partial results for orthogonal groups in all dimension and symplectic groups and some orthogonal groups in even dimension. But as I said, in this case, in particular, this case, you have too many to extension, too many. And it gets more complicated to try to establish this uh, property by using these maximal subgroups, for example. So in my opinion, I would try with a different argument to try to eliminate them. And also know that here, we also have the unitary groups where I hide them, but they are here, the unitary groups with a minus, PSL minus means the unitary groups. So the unitary groups appear here. So this corollary is more or less of the shape of the uh, of, of Schwachner and Smith theorem, but with p equals two and with more simple groups in the list. They only have the unitary groups, but here we also have all of them. Uh, but it's more or less of the same flavor. So I, I think I will finish, but maybe very briefly mention what happened with alternating and sporadic components. I will go very fast. So there is a, a theorem that we also prove with, with Steve that basically if we have a simple component L with, with this assumption here, the pi divides the order, P divides the order, we, we take then the central product of all the conjugates, they all commute with each other. We take the centralizer of all the components at the same time. We, by induction, you can assume that this satisfies the conjecture. And we have this extra requirement on the homology that the map from APL to the automorphism group induced by G this is in map, which is non-zero homology. If we have this, one, two, and three, but maybe obtain inductively, but this one is, actual, is actually a requirement, something that we need to prove. But if you have that, then you, this, uh, the group G satisfies the conjecture. So in particular, if this group here is just L because you are adding nothing else, then you are done. And for example, if V is an odd prime, then alternating group and sporadic groups do not have uh, automorphism groups, outer automorphism group of odd order. So this is the identity map in these cases. And the identity map is non-zero because the conjecture holds there. So this automatically eliminates alternating and sporadic components for P0. And for P equals two, also in some cases allows you to do that by using the same trick or explicitly showing that this map is not zero. For example, you can do it for, for these groups here, some alternating groups, Matthew groups, and Higman sips groups. These are sporadic groups. So this is one of the one of the extra things that also could be done to eliminate, for example, this classical group, this matrix group that I mentioned in the previous slide. You can try to establish, for example, the property in point four. So I think I will finish here. This is already too much, but this is an example of how we can, can we do this by using this construction I mentioned before that, okay, take it deposit just APL and then see how the remaining uh, automorphism glued to it. Okay, and then, then, then you got this, this log exact sequence with the centralizers, which is basically the link. And then you can try to establish that this map is non-zero homology. A will be the automorphism group. You want to prove this is non-zero. For example, if this one is zero, and this is non-zero, then you get a non-zero inclusion and you are done. This is basically what, what you want to do. And this is what is done for A8. And something a bit more complicated can be done for HS uh, by understanding the, the, the possible extensions of it, which basically are, it's only, there's only one and you have two elements outside, two 
conjugacy classes outside 2C, which are denoted by 2C and 2D. And then you show that this sum map in H2 in this case is surjective, and then you show that H2 of the automorphism group is non-trivial and you are done because then this map is non-zero and then you comply this theorem. So this HS cannot appear as a component of your minimal control example. Okay, so I'll finish here. <laughs> this is too much already. So that's all. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Um, any questions uh, for Kevin? Uh, just this uh, last part you mentioned about uh, mapping into automorphism group. Is it a general uh, conjecture you can make out of this, like the map on the homology of AP, mapping into the AP of the automorphism? Uh, yeah. No, this is not true in general. This is false in general, yes. In, in general? Yes. Um, for example, I think even for um, in characteristic P, for example, it's, it should take the PSL in characteristic three, a P, sorry. And so this is a wedge of spheres. And then suppose you uh, add a field automorphism of order P. Mm -hmm. Then what we proved recently is that this is again a wedge of spheres of bigger dimension one now. So the map will uh, be zero. Yeah. It, it decreases the dimension. And, and this also happens with a, a simple example is with A5 and the, the alternative group five and the symmetric group five. A5 uh, is uh, for a, A2 of A5 is basically the building of PSL25. PSL25 is just the building there is just discrete, right? So just points. So this is a wedge of zeros, spheres of dimension zero for A5. But for the symmetric group in five letters, this is a connected poset of dimension one. So this is a wedge of one spheres. So the inclusion now is, is again, is the zero map in the homology because one is a wedge of zero spheres and the other one is the wedge of one spheres for A5 and S5. Yes, yeah, so th that's maybe the simple example. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know if for other for bigger alternating groups, this is this holds or not. Uh, that, that I don't know. That, that case is very particular, but for bigger alternating groups and with the symmetric group, maybe there is some hope that this map is non-zero homology. So I, I have a question. So, um, uh, I mean, this doesn't go towards the uh, goal of this research, but because you've made a lot of computations, maybe you have seen, have you ever like uh, found some APs which have uh, torsion in homology? I think very few examples are known. Uh, yeah, I think there is an example with S13, I think was. Yeah, that's probably uh, Shirishian's. Yes, in the paper uh -huh. of uh, Sean's. Um, yeah, I, I think this is the only example I know. Okay. This is for P. Well, okay, this is for P equals three, right? And mm -hmm. and seeing the torsion is in H two, if I don't remember that, it is in H two. Um, no, but I have a clue. On in, in a different one, we may have torsion in the fundamental group. And it's I think it was P C U uh, four three. I think it's maybe for this one and B equals two. This one, I don't know. Mm. Uh, yeah, this one, I, I think this is not too big, but still I cannot do it in my computer. Maybe you can you can do it <laughs> and tell me. Um, there is a reason here that if I take uh, she, only she you for three, if I take this one and I take A2 here, okay, this, this one is contractible because we have a center here of order two. Mm -hmm. So the O2 core, the two core here is non-trivial. So this poset is contractible, but you take the elements above the center of order two. So above the center of order two, 
the fundamental group here, uh, I think this one has torsion. Mm -hmm. So, but this is not exactly the equivalent pose it, but it embeds into this one. Mm -hmm. When you go to the quotient by the center, it embeds here, A2. So maybe there, there is some hope here and we can show that this one also doesn't have a nice uh, fundamental group, which is not, I mean, it's mm -hmm. not It's not a free group. Thanks. But indeed, I have a paper with uh, with Gabriel Minian, which was my, my advisor in my, in my PhD. Um, and we showed that the fundamental group of these poses is not always a free group, which also showed that they are not always a wave of a sphere. And I think the example we had is it A10. I don't remember if it was with B equals, I think it was with B equals three, yes. That we show that the fundamental group of uh, A3 of alternative group 10 is not a free group. Hmm. So, but in, in, when in the homology, it, it has free homology, but the fundamental group has a, a presentation uh, that allows you to prove that this, this cannot be a free group, basically. So this is not a wedge of spheres because the, the fundamental group is not a free group, basically. Mm. Are they homology spheres, then? The homology? Not like, um, is the complex a homology sphere if the only problem is in the... Um, is, the is the fundamental group perfect? In that case, in A10, mm -hmm. no. Uh, okay. No, because when you when you divide by the by the der derived subgroup, when you abelianize the the fundamental group, you get a free group okay. of the with the same number of generators as the the fundamental group. Mm -hmm. So the, the problem is with the relations because the relations that we get in the presentation are commutators, basically, or something like commutators. So of course, when you divide by the commutator subgroup, you eliminate all the relations, and then what you get is uh, an abelian group of the same rank um, at the number of generators. So that's that's basically why this is not a free group because you have non-trivial re uh, relators in the presentation which are contained in the commutator subgroup. And when you abelianize, you 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 don't reduce the number of generators. You still have the same number of generators, but with non-trivial relations. Is this? That's why this is not a free group. Okay. Any other questions? There's a question in the chat. Right. Oh, okay. So if not, oh, there's a question. Where? Oh, okay. Yeah. So the there's a question in the chat. Uh, which asks, if Cullen's conjecture was true, would it simplify the uh, classification of finite simple groups? Uh, well, what a nice question. Okay, I think so. this is the same question that Quiller, uh, Quiller asked to himself <laughs> at that point. The, uh, this is what history says, <laughs> what I was told. I think at the beginning, he tried to, I don't know if simplify the, the, the proof, because at that point, I think it was not finished. Um, I think what he wanted is to simplify the proof of the Faye Thompson theorem on odd groups. I mean, every mm -hmm. group of odd order is solvable. I think this is what he wanted at the beginning. And then they realized that Quillen's conjecture was even more difficult than proving that theorem. So, <laughs> <laughs> and at the end, we see that if we want to try, if we want to prove the conjecture, we rely on the classification at some point. So it would be, great to have a, a proof of this conjecture without using the classification and then see if this can be applied to reduce some parts of it. But I think in, nowadays uh, people, uh, I don't know, if, if trust on that anymore. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Kevin. You're welcome. Let's thank uh, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Thanks you. Thank you.